Good morning. We invite those who are here in person and those who are attending our service this morning at home by a live stream to give your undivided attention in the next few minutes as we turn our attention to the Word of God. We bow before the throne of God as we worship, and that continues during our sermon time because we're bowing before His Word that He has revealed to us to bring to our attention a scripture that will hope subject that will hopefully be beneficial uh, to us. The subject this morning is, we just prayed as Wayne led our prayer. He prayed about how thankful we are for Jesus. And that certainly ought to be true. And what we try to do in gospel preaching, uh, what better subject could one address than the subject of Jesus? But having said that, we also realize that just the name Jesus offers an infinite possibility of subjects, doesn't it? I mean, how many different areas of Bible teaching could one go into just with the subject of Jesus? And so I'm going to direct our attention to a statement that he has made about himself. To me, this is very familiar, but it represents a self-statement, a statement in which he uses the personal pronoun, I. This is what I am. And so this represents him in a very foundational, uh, representative way. He saith unto him, that is Thomas, in this setting, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. Thomas had responded to a statement that Jesus made. Jesus was getting ready to ascend, of course, and as he was doing that, he said that they would be able to know where he went. And Thomas then raised a question, and this is back in the fifth verse, uh, just previous to this. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, how know we the way, uh, if that we may be also and so how we may know the way, how we may go whither thou goest. I'll get that correct. So Thomas was responding naturally. He said, Lord, we don't know the way because we don't know where we're going. <laughs> and so that's a basic principle, isn't it? We have to know where we're going in order to know how to get there. And so Jesus responded to him with this statement. Saith unto him, that's Thomas, I am the way. All you need to know to know the way is to know me. And so we emphasize that as our subject in thinking about Jesus this morning as simply the way. Let's don't underestimate what that means and how many different applications that has to our lives. It answers so many questions. It gives us so much meaning uh, to life just understanding that Jesus is the way. I'd like for us to take a look at the word that he used. And as we look at the word that Jesus spoke, he said, I am the hodos. Well, we don't need to remember that, except it's helpful to know that that word that Jesus used is a very common word in the synoptic gospels, as this quote from Vine's Dictionary expresses. A, it means a natural path a road, or B, a traveler's way. So, Gallia Pike is a road a, a hodox. It is a way. It is a road. It is a highway. It is a traveler's way. That's one road that we all have in common. When we leave here to go home, we all will go on Gallia Pike to some extent and then go our various different ways. So when Jesus says, I am the way, He's telling them that what I am to you is uh, a natural path, a roadway, uh, uh, a highway, a way to travel. And so that's significant because as we look at that, let's take that into a meaning that will hopefully be as applicable as I can make it to each of us this morning. I've got you, each of you on the screen. That's you. Well, each of us has... A destination. All of us have destination. Destinations, plural. <clears throat> We're going somewhere. There's something to which we need to go. 
And especially when we're talking about this, we're talking about in the spiritual application, all things and all places related to our spiritual well-being. We could extend that even further and say, as they apply to here on earth, as they apply to life hereafter. And so this is destination is a word that represents everything to related to our Christian lives, all things and all places related to our spiritual life and our spiritual well-being. Well, we're going to develop this as a main chart. But one of the things that we're beginning with as the very basic concept of Jesus' identification is that he is that way. The only way to get to that destination, remembering that that re represents all things, all places necessary for you spiritually. Jesus is the way. He is the only way. Now, that's not agreed to by all religious people today. There are religious people who see other ways. But when we accept what the Bible teaches and take what God has said, Jesus revealed in this passage, John 14, 6, I am the way. So let's take that. And what we're going to see on this chart as we look at the development of scriptures, and we're going to have quite a few scriptures in these boxes on each side. But let's just first of all take the designation of God. Each of us needs to have God as our destination. Each of us this very day need to be going to God. He needs to be our destination. Of course, that's in a spiritual sense, but it's still very real and still very necessary. And so looking at this, what does that mean? Well, let's go back at the very beginning thought of Jesus said and what he said. And how important that is. Jesus said, I am the way. Uh, okay, we've already understood that. We're not questioning that. Jesus is the one and the only hodos. He is the one and only way to get to anywhere spiritually. But notice he said, no one. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, you think how many people in the religious world today believe otherwise or believe in someone else as the one through whom they can go to reach God as their destination. How many millions and millions of people believe that Muhammad is that way? That's not what the Bible says. And there are others that could be listed. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 18... The Apostle Paul made this simple statement to the Corinthians. All things are of God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. The reason that you can have God as your destination today, the reason you can go to God, of course, in prayer, in thought, in meditation, in Bible reading, is because he has reconciled you to him. If you're a Christian... Through the blood of Christ, as he reconciled us to himself through Christ. So that destination very clearly illustrates the point of the affirmation of Jesus. Say, I am the way. I am the way to your Father in heaven. It's only through me that you can ever go to him. Well, let's look at something else. Let's talk about our holy place. Every religion has a holy place. Christianity has a holy place. Judaism had a, has a holy place. Islam has a holy place. You think about those holy places. Pilgrimages are required. Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Median in Saudi Arabia. Or for the Muslims, Jerusalem is their third most holy place. And under that golden dome in Jerusalem, when you see the panoramic view of Jerusalem, you see that golden dome. That's the Temple Mount. That's where the Temple of God stood. But not for a long time. It's owned by the Arabs. It's a mosque for Islamic religion. Under that mosque is regarded as a holy place because there is an outcropping of rock that is claimed to be Mount Moriah. 
That's where Abraham offered Isaac. And as from Abraham came the great religions, that is also believed by those of the Islamic faith, that that's the point from the earth in which Muhammad ascended back to heaven in a, 600 years after Christ. So that is their holy place. But pilgrimages are required. Every male Muslim is required to make a pilgrimage to a holy place at least once in their lifetime. And, of course, uh, there are many more. Judaism has their holy place in Jerusalem. It's not that golden dome. That's the Muslim religion. Their holy place in Jerusalem is that western wall that you see from time to time in the news. That western wall is sometimes called the Wailing Wall. It is a wall that is recognized because the stones that are revealed are Herodian. That means they have been placed there during the era of Herod the Great, when he was rebuilding the temple, even during the life and ministry of Christ. They're recognized by a beveled edge, and that's the holy place of the Jews. And standing and facing the western wall, to the left is an arch, and under that arch is the Holy of Holies for them, as they try to carry on without their beloved temple that used to stand uh, on top of the Temple Mount. So holy places. So we ask, one destination that you should have is your holy place. We have a holy place. And let us develop this thought just a little bit. In Hebrews chapter 9, in the first nine verses, we will read verse 8. This entire passage can be read and, of course, developed in your mind and your thinking. But the way unto the holy place has not yet been made manifest while the first tabernacle is yet standing. So what the Hebrew writer is doing is emphasizing the superiority of the holy place that we now have over the one over the mosaical dispensation. The first tabernacle. And while it was yet standing or used, the way into the holy place that we now have had not been had not been revealed. But in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, but Christ entered in once for all into the holy place, having attain, obtained eternal redemption. Now enters the Lord and our holy place. He entered in once for all, one time for all time, sprinkling His blood, dedicating that place for all having obtained eternal redemption. And then in chapter 9 and in verse 24, For Christ entered not into a holy place made with hands, but into heaven itself, now to appear before the face of God for us. So you and I can read plain statements in Scripture. All we need to do is take our Bibles and take what God said, and only what God said, and understand these things. God clearly affirms there is a way in the, the holy place, your holy place. There is a way into that, as Hebrews chapter 9 affirms. Christ has already entered it and obtained eternal redemption for us. But now in that holy place, if you notice the bottom of this statement, that's one of the most comforting statements in the book of Hebrews, or maybe the New Testament, depending on how it affects us. What is he doing there? He's appearing before the face of God for you. We need someone to appear before the face of God. That's how He is the way unto God. That's how we have a way into the holy place because He is in heaven itself, the identity of the holy place, now in the present tense to appear before the face of God for us. In Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 20, by the way which he dedicated for us a new and living way through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now let's make sure we're understanding what these verses are saying that's so important to each of us in our Christianity, our devotion to Christ, our appreciation to Christ, our being thankful for Christ our seeing Him in His singular importance to us. He's got to have that 
in our hearts and in our minds. And these things are helping us to develop thinking that's based on biblical thought that will provide that for us. But the way, and notice how this passage in Hebrews chapter 10 addresses the way into the holy place. He dedicated it for us, but notice how it's described. It's a new way, not the old way, it's new, but it's also living. It's a living way. And it's through the veil that takes you back to the topology of the Old Testament tabernacle, the veil that separated the holy of holies from the most holy place, the veil that was rent. Jesus went through that veil, but here in this figurative language, the Hebrew writer says, that is to say, here's what I'm talking about, folks, his flesh. What was the veil that allowed entrance into that holy place? The flesh of Jesus. So this puts him as exactly uh, what he said. I am the way. I am the way into that holy place. Through my flesh, in other words, through his body. That causes us to think about his death, his suffering, the shedding of his blood, his ascension back to heaven, his being in heaven, his sprinkling his blood. It was through him that... We go through to give us access into our holy place. Let me suggest before we leave this to go to another thought. You need to have your holy place as a destination. It's not just a one time after life and the next life after death thing, after death. But we need to have our holy place as a destination every day. But how can we survive spiritually? How can we keep ourselves alive and vital spiritually without going into the holy place and having our prayers, our petitions, our thanksgivings presented to God and before the very face of God without going into the holy place? We may not think in those terms, but I suggest to you we need to think in those terms more. Because we have a holy place. There is a way that's a new and living way. It's through Jesus, the only way that we get into that holy place. So if you go to that holy place today, and we certainly are during this worship service, and hopefully throughout the rest of the day, each of us can, it's only through Jesus that you can do that. Appreciate Him in His singular importance to you. Well, <clears throat> you've got to have the truth as your destination. That means you can't have falsehood. You can't have false doctrine. You can't have lies. You can't have deception. You've got to have as your destination... The truth. Why? Well, it's explained several times in the Scripture. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 34, You shall know the truth, and you know the rest of the verse, surely, and the truth shall make you free. It's not lies and deception that will make you free. It's not false doctrine that will make you free. It is the truth. That Expression refers to the body or system of doctrine that you and I would otherwise call the gospel of Christ, the New Testament. But it's called the truth. And you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14? He said, I'm the way. But I want you to know I am also the truth. Now think of him and why he's so singularly important to all of us is because He is the truth. Now, <clears throat> obviously, what He means is that He personified. It's in Him as a person. He personifies the truth. All of it is in Him. So let's think about this in terms of what John said earlier in John chapter 1 and verse 17. As He made the statement, the law was given through Moses. We, we understand that from Old Testament. The law was given through Moses, great Old Testament character. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
So this is the way it's to what, what, in contrast to the old Mosaical law, which is no longer in force, it was abolished by the death of Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 teaches this. And what was brought in was grace and truth. But I want us to add to our destination. You see, that, that causes us to think, surely does it not? That indicates that not only must the truth be a destination of yours, I've got to get at the truth. I've got to find the truth. I've got to get to the truth. But also, God's grace. They came together through Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 and verse 17. In Hebrews chapter 1, in the beginning, the very beginning words of the great book of Hebrews, God, after He spoke uh, long ago, let me get that up there, uh, to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in His Son. So we've already indicated what Jesus has said. We, we need to get to the truth. We think there's a lot of different people. We hear today so much, and I'm hearing more and more from people in the religious world. I don't know whether it's out of desperation or exactly what it is, but there are many roads that lead to heaven. I suggest that's not true. I suggest that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what God said. There's only one way to heaven. Because it's through Jesus as the way and the truth that we have the revelation of God's Word. In this last day, last dispensation, He has spoken to us in His Son. In other words, everything that God intends to say to you and say to me, everything, the complete all-sufficient revelation of God in this Christian dispensation has been said in one person, and that is, of course, Jesus Christ. It's only through Him as the way to that truth and to God's grace that we can arrive at those matters. And who would ever think that one can go to heaven without the truth, without God's grace? Uh, the, the, the Bible will not permit uh, such thinking. But we want to add another thought. Let's call it the abundant life. Uh, that's suggestive of some different thoughts that are given in the Scriptures in the New Testament, but with the main word there being life. A destination that you should have today is not only God Himself, not only the holy place, not only the truth and God's grace, but life. And life that is abundant this is what Jesus actually meant in John chapter 14 and verse 6 when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. That's what he is. Just as he is a personification of the truth because God revealed all things through him. He is the truth. He is also the life. Now notice what he said in a later passage in John chapter 10 and verse 10. He said, I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly. So it's not just a, a trickle of life. It's not just a weak form of life. It is life in an abundance. And I want us to take a look at Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, where we have not a quote from this passage yet, but just simply the statement in this passage, Jesus promised. I want you to note this because we're going to look at the passage and see if this is not true where you take up your Bible and read the verses to see that this is true. Jesus promised those who follow Him, in other words, His disciples, those who are Christians, those who are children of God, a life greatly enriched now with eternal life in the next world. Is that not true? That's his, that, that will be His own commentary, His own explanation of the abundant life. Let's notice this passage in a little more detail. Here's what it said. 
This is verse 29. Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake. Now, we're kind of expecting a complete thought there, but we'll get to that. But let's just note what he said in verse 29. He said, I'm talking to you about people who leave their homes, who leave their family members, their closest loved ones on the face of the earth, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, and their property, their farms. Not everyone has to do that, but some have to do that, as he said, for my sake. In order to have me, they have to do that. But they can't have that and me if that is more important to them or that's interfering with me. They have to give that up and for my sake and for the gospel's sake. So make sure we have that complete thought in mind. Now, what about those who do this? He shall have received a hundred times as much now in this present age Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and farms, along with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. We couldn't have a clearer statement of commentary on what Jesus meant when he talked about the abundant life. That anyone who left the physical things of this world for his sake, for the gospel's sake, are going to be down and out. No. He shall have and receive a hundred times as much. Now, let's don't make a mistake here. Let's think clearly with me now. It becomes very obvious to every reader of this passage that Jesus is not talking about a literal 100 times in the present age. He's going to increase your house a hundred times or your closest loved ones or brothers and sisters, mothers, children a hundred times, or your farm a hundred times, literally, physically. But what he means is this. If you have to leave any of these things, what you will have is an abundance of blessings that I give you. I'm not going to make you a millionaire. I'm not going to make you a possession of wealth and property. I'm going to make you abundantly rich spiritually. Along with persecutions, by the way. Under time, hey, we, we maybe to do without that, but that's a part of the part of it. And so that's the way he promised an abundant life. It's not going to leave us desolate, or he's going to leave us unblessed. We may not have, if we have to turn away from something in order to have Him, He said, I want you to be willing to do that. I want you to be humble enough and willing to make the sacrifice severe enough to have me. And if you do, you'll have the abundant life. A hundred times. But what's important to me in this passage, and I trust to you as well, is not just what is ours in this present age but what's for us in eternity. That's forever and forever and ever. In the world to come, eternal life. That's, of course, the abundant life and the ultimate. And so we come back to this and we recognize that it is through Him and only through Him. A lot of folks seek what they call the abundant life through different sources, material, Sometimes different sources in a spiritual nature. But it's only through Christ that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He is the way to that life. And He promised. And we are able to read His description of it in this passage. Well, we have, I believe this is the last destination that we'll talk about in this lesson this morning. Your prepared home. Well, I'm going to leave the building and go to my home. Well, yes, you will. And thankfully, we are blessed with nice homes. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. And that's not what this chart is representing. Your prepared home obviously brings to mind the statement that Jesus had made earlier in John chapter 14. 
Let not your hearts be troubled. Do you remember how he started the chapter to the apostles preparing them to leave? But he's preparing them by saying, I'm going to leave you. You're going to be on the earth without me to carry on our work. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, when you think about that, uh, how important that is, that Jesus promised that not only to these in immediate present, but to all of us as disciples. And let's look at the next verse, because in John chapter 14 and verse 3, and he said, if I go, and he, he doesn't mean there's a possibility that he wouldn't, and the word if occurs in the sense of since I go, and prepare a place for you. Now, read carefully. I come again. I'm coming back. I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. While I'm gone, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm coming again and will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What a a wonderful, marvelous thought about our relationship to Christ and his singular importance to us. He left, he was here in his earthly ministry. He was willing to die and suffer for our sins, resurrected from the dead, ascend back to heaven. And when he ascended back to heaven, what he's been doing is high priestly ministry, interceding for us. But he has also prepared a place for who? You, me, all who are his faithful disciples. Why? Because he's going to come and what is the only way you can get to that prepared place? Well, here it is in this verse. He's going to come back. And He's going to come and get you in His second coming. Uh, The the rest of the Scripture describes that great day. We shall all be gathered around the judgment seat. And there will be a separation from the left and the right. Matthew 25. But to those who are faithful, Jesus will accept into His presence and may receive you unto Myself, this verse says, that where I am... Where I am and am going to spend eternity, you're going to be with me. What a wonderful, encouraging thought. There's only one way for you to get to that prepared place. There's only one way. It's not through any other preparation. It's not through any other person. It's through Jesus Christ. And when he said, I'm the way, he said, I am it. And when you get back to our description, uh, as we bring our lesson down to some of our final thoughts, we've talked about he is the way to all things and places related. There's not one. If you would ask me and say, Lynn, put something up there that is important or necessary to my spiritual well-being and my going to heaven. Put it up there. There's nothing to put. Everything, every single solitary thing that's important to you, to your spiritual well-being in this life and eternal life in the next is in Jesus Christ. And we need to understand Him. We need to appreciate Him. We need to love Him. And we need to understand His singular importance. In this lesson, we've talked about He is the way to these things. We've singled them out and talked about each of them because each is important to all of us. They must be our destinations. We must have a a destination of each of these. And we must go to them frequently. How can I make it through difficult times? Jesus is the way. How can I live each day and meet all of the challenges that confront me and want to destroy me and cause me to lose my soul? How can I do that? Jesus is the way. And we can go on and on. And we know, as you know, as good Bible students, as we bring this to our focus, that Jesus is the way. One more thought. And it looks like we're beginning where we started. We're back going through this again. No. Well, we do have a final chart. (laughs) 
Instead of starting with Jesus, we're starting with the way. But there's an important way for us to think about this. We've talked about Jesus as the way. But now let's talk about the way to Him. Because if we're not with Him, then whether He's the way or not, it doesn't really matter, does it? To those who are not Christians, to those who are not disciples, to those who are not children of God, as the Bible teaches, it doesn't matter what Jesus is. The first thing that must be done is to find the way to Him. And there's only one way to do that. He extended this invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The way to Jesus, as we know, is taught in his teaching, as represented in these few passages and many others. He teaches us that the way to him is to believe in him. If you don't, you're going to die in your sins, he said in John 8, 24. You've got to repent of your sins. If you don't, you won't have remission of them, Acts 2, 38. You've got to confess with your mouth the belief that's in your heart. Paul taught the Romans in chapter 10 and verse 10. And in so many other passages, but in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, the Apostle Paul taught that as many of you as were baptized into Christ, he didn't say as many of you as prayed into Him, as many of you as believed your way into Him. While belief is important, the action that is into Him, the way that is actually into Him, is taught in the Scriptures as being baptized, as many of you as were baptized into Christ, did put him on. We urge each of us to think about that as it applies to us. For those who are at home watching and listening to this sermon via live stream, we encourage and urge you to look at your own personal situation in your relationship to Christ.